Anybody need a copy of our outline of the soul's redeemed conscience? You gave me one last week, but Jenny took it out this morning. Yeah. kind of introduced this study at the close of our class last week. Uh, there's the official bell. I didn't know I was going to have a bell ringer this morning. No, well, we did at least. <clears throat> <clears throat> but you recall uh, in our uh, previous uh, studies uh, passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, verse 8, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, talked about us being absent from the body when we're absent from the body we're present with the Lord he's talking about being absent from the body whenever uh, we die when we pass from this life to the next uh, we also noted Philippians chapter 1 uh, verse 23 with the Apostle Paul whenever uh, he saw that his time on this earth was coming to a close he had this desire to depart and to be with Christ well that brings up the question then that we're going to be pursuing in this study, what is the state or condition of those who have departed from this life and are presently with, as, Jesus, as Paul said in these passages, say presently with uh, Christ. And we have also from time to time looked at this passage in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4 where uh, Paul stated in, in uh, verse 13 and verse 14, we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you saw as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So the passage indicates that uh, presently uh, those who have fallen asleep are with Jesus, and, it, and Jesus is going to bring these individuals with him uh, at this time of uh, the, the last trump, as Paul talks about in the context. Uh, but you know, what is the state of these individuals who sleep in Jesus, those who are now asleep? Uh, does this mean that these individuals are unconscious? Uh, so in our study, we're going to consider the doctrine uh, as it's known as soul sleeping uh, and make observations concerning that doctrine and we hope to learn what the Bible says about the state of those who are currently asleep in uh, Jesus in particular asleep in Jesus of course that we'll notice generically applies to uh, all who have been a part of this life but our concern mainly is the souls of uh, those who are redeemed and presently as the Bible says sleep in Jesus and so we'll look at the doctrine itself uh, how it unfolds and then we'll examine uh, then uh, the uh, passages that are used the arguments that are used to substantiate this doctrine of soul sleeping and then we'll move on then in our studies to uh, passages that I uh, believe indicate uh, the state of uh, those who are uh, now uh, gone into the next life and presently with Christ let's begin with a word of prayer uh, most holy and divine Father, we're thankful to you for this Lord's Day, and we're thankful, Father, for the local church arrangement that enables us to assemble with fellow saints, to study your word, and to come before you in worship and prayer. And pray, Father, that all that we say and do this hour and the next will be in accordance with your will and serve to edify all that are present. We're thankful, Holy Father, for the great sacrifice that Jesus, your Son, our Savior, made for us on the cross. We're thankful for the redemption this provides uh, for us and the forgiveness of our sins. We pray you continue to bless us with this forgiveness and this right standing relationship that we have with you in Christ. 
We're thankful, Father, for the revelation you've given to us of your uh, will for our lives and the revelation you've given to us of uh, what we can expect when this life is over and with you uh, in, that e in that heavenly home you promised to the faithful. We're mindful, Father, of those we're number that are gone because of sickness and illnesses and those that are uh, set for upcoming surgeries and pray you'd be with them and restore them to their health, provide what they need uh, to uh, make them well, be your will, and they can be with us once again. We're thankful, Father, for all those that are teaching your word this hour, all those that are students of your word this hour, and pray to continue to be with us as we strive to make application of our studies to our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, the doctrine of, so did you perchance need an outline? Debbie, did you get it last time? Okay, sounds fine. Uh, the, the doctrine of soul sleep, according to this doctrine, uh, the idea is the souls of the departed, those who have uh, departed from this life, they continue to exist, but they are in an unconscious state until the resurrection. And this unconscious state is kind of uh, what we would think of like a deep coma. Uh, and they are in that state until the, the final uh, day and the final day of, re of the resurrection. And those who hold this concept present a couple of arguments to substantiate this. Uh, for one, uh, they'll note that the scriptures uh, abound with references in which death is spoken of as sleep. Uh, we first go back to the Old Testament, and in particular the Old Testament books of the kings uh, speak repeatedly of death as sleep. And we'll read these uh, few passages here. This is not all of them you'll find in the Kings, but just give you an idea of what we're talking about here and where this doctrine of soul sleeping comes from, uh, first of all, uh, in these Old Testament passages. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 10. You want to begin, Isaac, this morning? So David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. <clears throat> Say again the first part of that. So David rested. With rested, his right. Uh, and you just want to note uh, that in most translations, uh, New King James Version, I don't know which one you're using for sure on it, it does say rested. But if you have the uh, 1611, uh, with, in other words, the the author has the, the King James Version, it says sleep. Uh, it in the in the passage, uh, David slept, I mean, uh, with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. New King James Version that I have uh, has a footnote by rested, uh, died and joined his ancestors. And uh, of course that is the idea, so he, he died and uh, went to be gathered with his ancestors. We looked at that phrase uh, earlier in our, uh, in our studies and we'll look at it again in another study that we have uh, coming up. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, people who try to substantiate this doctrine of soul sleeping uh, contend that this, uh, uh, this statement that David slept or rested indicates that uh, his soul is uh, in a literal sense asleep or in a deep coma. Look at uh, 1 Kings 11 and verse 43, if you will, Mindy. Rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. Okay, again, the, the translation says slept, uh, but the King James Version, if any of you have it, or you do or not, but you can look it up. King James Version says uh, said uh, that they slept uh, as opposed to rest. And First Corinthians or First Kings chapter fourteen and <laughs> verse twenty here. The time that Jeroboam reigned. Now you've got the New American Standard Bible, and it says slept. I didn't realize that, but it has slept instead of rested. A lot of the modern translations, as far as I know, uh, say uh, rested as opposed to slept. But again, just pointing out where this doctrine comes from in the Old Testament, and there's several of these references uh, to these Old Testament uh, people. Uh, and when it, once they died, they slept or they uh, rested <clears throat> then. 
that turning to the New Testament, uh, we find again the term uh, sleep used with reference to death, and it actually occurs about 15 times in the New Testament. We won't look at all these references, but just let you know how many times it does occur in the New Testament. We'll look at Matthew chapter 27, and uh, I've got verse 52 up there, but uh, you get in context. That's when Jesus died on the cross. If you would, uh, Debbie, read Matthew 27, verse 51 through 54. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. You wouldn't read 54 also if you would. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they, uh, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Verse 54 just explains uh, the significance of what took place, the earthquake, and then these by the saints had fallen asleep uh, being uh, raised. It was a sign that Jesus indeed was who he claimed to be, the Son of God, not just some ordinary man, but it, it actually deity uh, that was crucified on the cross. And the sentence structure in uh, some of these translations is uh, somewhat confusing, but uh, it appears what uh, took place is that the graves were opened whenever the earth quaked, when there was an earthquake that occurred and the rocks were split. You know, picture the graves there not being like our modern day graves where somebody is buried six feet. They had opens, uh, they had sepulchers and a stone rolled uh, over the opening and so the stone would be rolled back and then it would be opened, uh, opened up then is what took place. And Many of the body of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Uh, some, uh, the way it reads, it looks like that they came out before Jesus was raised from the dead, uh, which is just simply not the case because Jesus is referred to as the first fruits of, the, uh, of those that will be raised. He was the first one that was raised from uh, the dead and then the others followed. So the point is that the earthquake opened up the graves, but these individuals did not uh, actually uh, come out in their resurrected state until after Jesus' resurrection. And then they went to the Holy City and appeared to many. But we're looking at the passage to notice how they're described. Uh, these are described as those who had fallen asleep. Uh, so the New Testament is used to substantiate this doctrine of soul sleeping. Look at John chapter 11, verse 11 through 14. Uh, this is uh, preceding the um, time when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, his friend Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Florence, you want to read John 11, 11 through 14 for us? These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So here we see again this reference to uh, someone who has fallen asleep. But Jesus makes it clear that he's referring to the fact that he had died and not to uh, the idea that the disciples had that maybe he was just taking some kind of a restful sleep and then he would, uh, he would awaken from that. It's just another passage that's used uh, by individuals to substantiate the doctrine of soul sleeping. And I said there's uh, some 15 of these. Uh, don't have them on your charts there, but uh, for example, Acts 7, uh, verse 59 through 60, we've read that before, uh, where uh, Stephen, uh, first martyr, was, uh, uh, was put to death, was stoned to death. It says he fell asleep in uh, verse 60 of that passage. In uh, 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, verse 6, the Apostle Paul uh, talking about uh, those who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ said that uh, he was seen by some 500 brethren 
at one time uh, after his death, and thus proof that he was raised from the dead. But he said of those 500, some of them have already fallen asleep, he stated. And then also in the same passage where Paul is uh, substantiating the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, uh, he said in verse 20 that uh, Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's just some of the passages, some of the 15 some passages that refer to those who have departed uh, as uh, being asleep. And then this 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 through 14 passage that we read uh, at the opening of our study where Paul speaks of those saints who had died as being asleep. Uh, saying they sleep in Jesus. Uh, so this is the way that some get this doctrine of soul sleeping, that they're not conscience. Uh, they are, uh, as we would think of seeing an individual asleep uh, in kind of a deep coma uh, state and not aware of what's going on while they are asleep. Do you have a question or comment here? The people that believe this, how do they justify where you're Jesus wept here at Lazarus. If he was just sleeping, you know, why would Jesus mm -hmm. show that one time kind of emotion of, you know, weeping? Yeah, right. If they were just asleep. Yeah, well, uh, that's inconsistency of uh, teaching that is not true as far as that goes on. Of course, they would probably uh, say that he is weeping uh, because he really did say he was dead on things and thus unconscious and so he was raised even from a state of unconsciousness is what they would say too uh, according to that particular passage or that particular context. Other questions or comments on at least these passages the Old Testament New Testament that do speak of death as sleep the New Testament using the term sleep for death. The, the other argument uh, made for soul sleeping that spirits are unconscious involves passages that uh, come very near, at least on the surface, uh, appear to say that the dead have no consciousness. And we'll look at uh, some of these and we'll, uh, in our uh, examination of the doctrine of soul sleeping, we'll come back and look at these to see what they uh, really do teach. But just look at them uh, first of all here from the idea of maybe substantiating this doctrine of soul sleeping. We'll look first at Psalm 6. Uh, Psalm 6 and verse 5, if you would, Donna. For in death there is no remembrance of you, in the grave who will give you thanks? You see, the point is in death, whenever one is dead, there's no remembrance of God. Uh, whenever a person's in the grave, uh, they can't give thanks to God. So on the surface, it looks like that maybe uh, these who are gone are unconscious uh, in a state of, uh, as they would say, soul, uh, soul sleeping. Psalm 30 and verse 9, a similar statement. Uh, Karen, if you would, Psalm 30 and verse 9. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? So what profit is there in my blood, in my life blood, my blood being shed, in other words. So when I go down to the pit, pit is used with reference to the grave. Will the dust, the dust uh, we know is reference to the body. Well, will the body praise God? Will it declare God's truth? Uh, these passages are used to try to substantiate soul sleeping or the idea that uh, a soul is unconscious in a state of unconsciousness uh, at, at death. Look at Psalm 115 and verse 17, if you would, Pam. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into the silence. See, the dead don't praise the Lord. No, nor any who go down into silence, the silence uh, of the grave on it. These passages again are used to substantiate soul sleeping. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, uh, I've got uh, chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, but if you would, Jack, uh, begin in verse 3. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 3 through 6. 3 through 6. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of 
men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards they go to the dead. For whoever is joined with all the living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. And I'll read verse 10 in connection to whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might and while you're alive. Uh, for there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Again, on the surface, it appears that uh, maybe there's not any consciousness uh, whenever one is in uh, the grave. Uh, uh, they have no more reward. The memory of them is forgotten. They know nothing. Verse 5 states their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Uh, never more will they have a share uh, in anything done under the sun. And one I didn't put up there um, or in your outline. Uh, I want to look at it uh, briefly here. I'll read it. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 38 is uh, another passage to run across that is used to substantiate the idea that uh, souls of those that are departed or unconscious. In Isaiah 38, uh, we have uh, here Hezekiah <coughs> uh, a writing uh, that he's responsible for whenever he had been sick and after he'd recovered from his sickness. And in uh, verse 18 and 19, he said, Sheol, that's the grave, cannot thank you, uh, that is God. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. So uh, he's praising God that he was uh, spared from, his, uh, from death uh, as a result of his sickness. And uh, he's uh, still able to praise God. But once he goes down the grave, he wouldn't be able to praise God anymore. Just another passage. Uh, there's others. Uh, but they're all very similar to this, uh, passages that uh, are used to indicate that the dead have no consciousness. Uh, no consciousness. Uh, that, this, uh, that's the theory, uh, and that's the arguments basically presented by those who believe in soul sleeping, uh, that the souls are unconscious. And at first glance, uh, the doctrine appears somewhat convincing. Uh, but what we want to do is take a closer look at uh, these passages, these arguments that are uh, used to substantiate this doctrine. Questions or comments on the doctrine itself, what we're looking at here in our studies. Let's examine the doctrine of soul sleeping then. Uh, first of all, we'll look at the first argument. Uh, we've looked at these passages, both Old and New Testament, where death is called uh, sleep. But one thing to notice is that Nowhere do these scriptures say that the soul of the departed one fell asleep. It was the person who fell asleep uh, can have reference to, and sometimes it very clearly has reference to, the body, not the soul. So that's one thing to note to begin with. Uh, it doesn't refer to the soul, the spirit of the individual. Um, very well uh, refers to the body. And that is certainly true. Uh, the body... Uh, cannot, for example, praise God uh, from the grave. Uh, the body uh, cannot thank God from the grave. The body is going to go back to corruption, uh, go back to the dust as it was. So uh, you, with that kind of a view, you can see how those arguments uh, are made by uh, some of these especially Old Testament passages. But then why are those who have died said to be asleep uh, the term sleep uh, can be figurative uh, for rest and a very appropriate one uh, for that matter too. Uh, sleep implies rest. Uh, when one sleeps literally there is rest from one's labors. Uh, so it is that the dead also rest from their labors. We have this passage in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, 13 won't look at it but uh, says that blessed are the dead who die in the Lord for a rest from their labors. I don't have the term sleep there, but just the point is that uh, sleep 
appears to be used in a figurative sense for rest. And you remember these passages we read back there in the Kings, some of the translations, rather than saying they slept, said they rested. That's the idea. Uh, they rested uh, from their labors and went on to be uh, with uh, their, their de other departed, departed loved ones, Old Testament passages. Uh, question or comments on um, and answering this doctrine of soul sleeping uh, by looking at this argument, death is called sleep. Sleep can be figurative for rest. It explains why that the term sleep is used. Also, sleep, uh, literal physical sleep, is only temporary and is followed by an awakening. So it's appropriate to speak of uh, especially the body being asleep and thus looking forward to an awakening uh, or uh, the same uh, thing with respect to physical uh, sleep and looking forward to an awakening. Look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. In uh, Daniel uh, chapter 12, uh, really begins back uh, about chapter 11 and uh, where uh, uh, Daniel is uh, prophesying this abomination of desolation and uh, Jesus applied this to the destruction of Jerusalem uh, initially. Uh, but he was also, it looks like, prophesying about uh, what was going to result from Jesus Christ uh, being raised from the dead and uh, others following uh, that. And that's what uh, the subject is in Daniel 12 and specifically verse 2. Uh, Isaac, you want to read that for us? And many of those who slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So they, see the idea, those asleep in the dust shall awake. Well, it's appropriate to refer to those who have died as being asleep from this perspective that uh, in literal physical sleep, uh, it's only temporary and you always awake from that sleep uh, once uh, the body is rested. Uh, remember John 11 in whenever uh, we saw these references to uh, Jesus going to uh, raise Lazarus from the dead. Uh, then you want to read John 11 verse 11? After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. So Lazarus sleeps, I'm going to wake him up. Well, the disciples thought that Jesus was referring to him taking a restful sleep, like we think of uh, sleeping at night or something. He's just going to wake him up. Uh, but he's actually referring to him being dead, and he is going to wake him up. Again, what we're seeing is uh, an explanation as to why death is called sleep, uh, because sleep, as we think of, in the literal physical sense is only temporary and is followed by an awakening. Uh, so though the souls may be conscious uh, during the time between one's death and the resurrection bodies, at the resurrection will be an awakening of the glorified transformed bodies in which to house our souls. Uh, because a human corpse lies in the grave still in sleep-like appearance, that being engraved in a casket, uh, as it were, resting, awaiting resurrection, it's appropriate to call death sleep. Uh, anybody know the literal meaning of cemetery? Literal meaning of cemetery is a sleeping place. That's the literal meaning of a cemetery, is a sleeping place. Well, we've always heard of a resting place. Yeah, resting place on things, that's right. Uh, so, uh, that's the literal idea of it. So what we have basically, when you boil it all down, sleep describes death pertaining to appearance. When referring to death, belongs to a category of speech which is called phenomenal. It, it, it's a figure of speech, uh, it's, and that figure of speech is called phenomenal. Uh, and it's pertaining to appearance. It's describing, not defining death. Uh, see, those that believe that uh, the term sleep uh, is defining death would say, well, it, the soul is unconscious. The soul is in a state of deep coma. The soul is sleeping on things. Uh, but it's a figure of uh, speech, and it's just describing, not defining 
death. Uh, we speak in phenomenal terms um, in uh, other everyday language type of things. Uh, for example, uh, we speak of the sun rising and the sun setting. Is that really literally what's happening? Is the sun literally rising? The sun, no. <laughs> the earth is rotating on its axis, isn't it? But with respect to appearance, it looks like the sun is rising. It looks like the sun is setting. That's, so it, we're using a figure of speech that's known as phenomenal. And that's the case with respect to all these references uh, to uh, a body being asleep or looking like it's asleep because it pertain, and pertaining to appearance, uh, that is the case. Questions or comments on uh, this argument number one? Yes, Jack. Yeah, question, talking about the, the Bible does the scripture doesn't say the soul is asleep. <coughs> Nothing says the soul is asleep or awake or worried. Just, you know, it refers to God. It's in God's hands. But yeah. what, where is it until... And my assumption is that final judgment day is for everyone. Then the, all the souls are judged, not the bodies. <clears throat> so yeah. it's it, if it's not asleep, is it still with the body? No, it's in some resting place. I, well, uh, well, we'll get to some of that when we talk about the resurrection, what the Bible says about the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection, our bodies, our, our bodies will be raised, but they're going to be changed. Uh, in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, and at that time, our souls will be reunited with the body, and it is uh, in this resurrected body and soul that we will stand before God in judgment. So, what is to say where the souls are or spirits are at now while you're? Well, what I what I contended in a study here last uh, the few weeks is that the souls of the righteous are with Christ right now. And I believe that with Christ means they're in heaven. Now, again, as I mentioned before, there's some uh, brethren who still believe that they're in a waiting place, uh, awaiting that final resurrection. But I believe that they're in heaven now and that we be reunited with their bodies uh, whenever the resurrection occurs and then stand before God in judgment. Well, that confuses me because if the righteous are with Christ in heaven, then somehow they're already judged. Well, and I, and I believe that that is the case, but the sentencing, the final sentencing, the final day of judgment has not occurred yet on things. And I don't know why I'd use the term judge necessarily as they know their destiny. But that's true even with the other scenario of a place of waiting because if we go to a place of waiting like illustrated uh, that's described as Abraham's bosom or a place of comfort, uh, those individuals, or if we're there, we know that we're already judged as righteous uh, because we're in that place of comfort, not in the place of torment. Uh, and those that go to that place of torment already know they've been judged, in essence, of unworthy uh, of going on into the heavenly home, but they haven't stood before the final judge again. And I'd liken that, again, to uh, someone committing a crime in our society. Uh, if the crime is serious enough, they're going to put them in jail before they go before the judge, before they go before the jury. They're going to be put in jail because they're a threat to society. They know the outcome. Uh, they may have an excellent lawyer and <laughs> realize they're going to get off, but you understand what I mean. They know the outcome. They know that the jury is going to find them guilty or the judge is going to find them guilty. Uh, before they finally go to their eternal place of a prison or something like that. And uh, that's the way I view the, the judgment. And we'll talk about that. We're going to have a special study on the judgment, what's going to occur on that day uh, on things. Uh, more of a final sentencing taking place and final reward taking place rather than determining the destiny of each individual. The destiny of each individual is already determined at death. So what I'm if thinking right now, or the way I'm understanding right now, the, the, the souls of the bad are going to Hades, and the souls of the righteous are going to Abraham's bosom, which would mean either hell or heaven. Well, uh, 
Abraham's bosom uh, was used with reference to the souls of the righteous Jewish people, especially going there now, uh, presented what I think is evidence that indicates we go to be with Christ. Now that may still be where Abraham's bosom's at, and that's fine on things, but I focus on the passages that say that uh, whenever we depart from this life, we'll go to be with Christ, and Christ in every reference that we have is in heaven rather than just in Abraham's bosom. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That I, that's what I've got so far in okay. the last yeah. couple of okay. statements. All right. All right. Further questions or comments on our today's up to this point? Let's look at this uh, second argument. Let's look at these passages, uh, which on the appearance kind of suggest the dead have no consciousness after uh, after death. Uh, let's look first of all at this Psalm 6 and verse 5, and there's several passages that were like this, but uh, we, we answer Psalm 6 and verse 5, we basically answered the rest of them. Uh, go back and read Psalm uh, 6 and verse 5 again. Let's see, who was the last one that read? Who's next? Dear, okay, if you would read Psalm 6 verse 5 again. For there is no mention of you in death, and she Does this mean one is unconscious <coughs> after death? That's our question uh, to, to be answered uh, here. Uh, in death there is no remembrance of God in the grave who will give you thanks. Uh, in, even in life, uh, the Bible warns there may come a time when uh, especially a sinner cannot or will not remember his creator. You know, we know the passage, Ecclesiastes in chapter 12 and verse 1. See, in death there's no remembrance of God. I'm just pointing out that even in life, uh, a person can get to a situation in life where uh, they, in essence, do not remember or refuse to remember uh, their creator. Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. Um, Debbie, are you there? Do you want to read that? Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. See, the argument in Psalm 6 and verse 5 is that uh, since you can't remember uh, God uh, uh, whenever you, uh, you're dead, that you must be in a state of unconsciousness. Well, does this passage, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, mean that when the evil days come, the sinner will not remember God because he's unconscious or because his opportunity is ended? Well, that's the idea. His opportunity is ended. Uh, the, re the word remember in these contexts in Psalm 6, verse 5, and here Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, means basically to acknowledge uh, acknowledge God in the days of youth um, and in the grave you can't acknowledge uh, God uh, the youth is to acknowledge his creator by obedience a uh, dead sinner can't acknowledge God uh, nor can the dead praise God uh, and that goes to these other passages Psalm 30 and verse 9 and uh, Psalm 115 and verse 17 we looked at uh, before. The reason why the sinner can't, uh, the dead sinner can't acknowledge God because their opportunity has ended. Their only opportunity to remember to acknowledge God is in this life. That's their only opportunity to do that. In Luke chapter 16, verse uh, 19 through 31, the rich man, the dead sinner, he was conscious. Uh, he knew Abraham. He remembered Lazarus. Uh, he remembered his brothers and remembered his own failures. But he couldn't remember God. He couldn't acknowledge God. His opportunity, in other words, to obey God had ended. Uh, look at Luke 16 and verse 26 uh, here. <clears throat> Let's see. Florence, you want to read that for us? And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Well, I must have the wrong reference there on things. <clears throat> Verse uh, uh, 24. He cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. They may dip the tip of the finger in 
water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in his flame. We see his conscience uh, is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, likewise as well as evil things, but now he's comforted you're tormented. Uh, and well, no, verse 26 is the right one. Besides all this, between us and there is a great goal fix so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The point is, is the opportunity to pass from where he's at and even Lazarus to pass from where he's at has ended. The opportunities uh, have, have ended uh, with uh, his death is the point we're trying to make uh, here. Look at Psalm 88. Uh, look at Psalm 88, <clears throat> and I have verse 5 up there, but uh, Karen, you want to read verse 1 through verse 5? Or no, it's Donna. Uh, Donna, no. I'm sorry. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 88. So go ahead. 88, 5. Yeah. For seven of the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and they are cut off from your hand. You know, drift from among the dead like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are caught off from your hand. We're seeing this word remember. And here God doesn't remember these individuals anymore. Well, does that mean that God is unconscious? No. It just simply uh, means that God will not acknowledge them anymore. Just trying to show how the term remember is used in all these passages. It refers to acknowledging God. God, God is conscience um, and, and could uh, literally physically remember them, but he's not going to acknowledge them anymore. At the same point, the sinful dead cannot remember God and God will not remember or acknowledge the sinful dead. Um, you know, I think of uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, uh, where Jesus in finishing up Sermon on the Mount uh, said of those who uh, refuse to uh, live in accordance with will, I will remember you no more. Uh, or I never knew you. I never <laughs> knew you on things. God would not acknowledge them in his, as his people. Well, uh, Psalm 6 and verse 5 is not indicating that uh, the souls of an individual is unconscious uh, at death. Uh, it's just uh, simply... Uh, indicating that uh, they no longer have an opportunity uh, to praise God, to uh, recall God, uh, things of that nature on things. Uh, we might have time to look here at Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 9, verse 5 through verse 6. Um, again here, at least get a start on it. <clears throat> uh, Karen, you want to read that for us? Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. This passage is uh, one of the go-to passages, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, indicating that uh, once uh, a person dies, their life uh, is totally over, they cease to exist. Uh, it's one of the favorite passages that they're, that they're going to go to uh, to show you that. But it doesn't teach that the dead are unconscious. If so, it's going to conflict with the passage we're going to look at later on as far as that goes. But to, to properly understand the meaning of this passage, uh, the context has to be considered. The writer is discussing what is done under the sun. That's why I had uh, Jack earlier read uh, from back in verse 3. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. One happens to all through the hearts. The sons of men are full of evil madness in the hearts while they live, and after that uh, they go to the dead. And then verse 6 uh, finishes up. Also the love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. These verses are discussing man's relationship to the earth, what's going on in this present life under the sun. Uh, the dead are gone from this life, having no part in it. 
they know nothing about current or future events on the earth. They do not have any more reward upon the earth, Pastor says. They have no share in anything done under the sun. Now they have, the righteous have many shares and many things <laughs> that are in that spiritual realm, whatever that spiritual realm is. Uh, but he's just talking about with respect to things done under the sun. Now the focus also is on this phrase, verse 5, uh, the dead know nothing. Uh, they do not know anything. That expression is found in other places and it illustrates that that's uh, limited to a particular circumstance. And again, the particular circumstance here is with respect to anything done under the sun. Uh, these individuals uh, have no relationship with the things that are done on this earth anymore, is the point of the passage. It's not indicating that they're unconscious, uh, that their soul is sleeping. Questions or comments on uh, our examination of these passages that suggest uh, that there is uh, this doctrine of soul sleeping. We're going to be looking at uh, the fact that the doctrine of soul sleeping is out of harmony with passages that clearly teach consciousness of souls after death in our studies next door that morning. Pat, question or comment? Oh, I, I was just going to say that, like the awareness after you're gone. I mean, there, you know, it talks about an awakening and things like that. But to me, consciousness means that I still have a choice to do right and wrong. Mm -hmm. That's what's taken away from us when we leave. Yeah. So we don't have the consciousness. In, I mean, when you think of it that way too, we don't have a conscience yeah. whether we're in a waiting place or we are already in paradise. Mm -hmm. The consciousness to make decisions of right or wrong is what's taken away from us. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's definitely so. As far as that goes, yeah. yeah right. Another question, comments on our studies here this morning. Next week, uh, we will look at some passages that uh, I believe do teach that uh, the souls of uh, those who have passed on, uh, not literally physically asleep uh, in any way or in, uh, sleep in any sense, but our conscience after death. Thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you again. I knew if I waited long enough, you'd just answer my question. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah, because there was a while I had some questions. I thought, I'm going to get to that. Okay, He's going okay. to answer my question. Then you, you did it every time. How are you? Good, Daddy. Good. I was just trying to point out where I understand what we've done yeah, up, up until this point. Yeah. 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 Ye